So now it is my honor to introduce our opening session with three very important leaders who are promoting cultural change and pain management at state and federal levels. In our history, we have witnessed changes, and some may say it's been a pendulum swinging back and forth a few times surrounding pain, the perceptions of pain and the standard practice for effective pain management. And despite these changes in norms, research supports a multidisciplinary, multimodal approach to pain care. We must coalesce these stakeholders to connect the dots in order to advance this person-centered, evidence-based pain management. It is not simple, we all know that, it is very complex. And we're gonna hear some groundbreaking updates from our three presenters about this today. First up is Dr. Singh. Many of you know her as the immediate past Chief Medical Officer for the US Department of Health and Human Services and Chair of the Pain Management Best Practices Task Force and also as clinical associate professor at Stanford in their department of anesthesiology, perioperative and pain medicine. Well, I am also excited to say I know her to be a very sincere and tireless advocate for patients with chronic pain as she works daily to share the important messages needed for better understanding and awareness. So thank you, Dr. Singh, and now to you. Hi, great. Thank you so much. I'm just getting my stopwatch started here. All right. And uh, so, <laughs> uh, so first of all, I want to thank Amy, Kevin, uh, your whole team for inviting me and giving me the honor to speak here to so many amazing stakeholders who are so important in this endeavor. And uh, I want to say that I'm also honored to be on the board of uh, this great organization, as well as uh, others that really, when you triangulate all these different efforts with so many different experts and perspectives, you know, the hope is that we really uh, continue to translate those ideas, concepts, practices, policies into uh, better clinical outcomes, which is really what all of this is about. Uh, next slide, please. So I've had the honor uh, of serving, uh, sorry, the, just the one right before, uh, the honor of serving in the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, as Chief Medical Officer. And in that endeavor, I chaired the uh, congressionally led uh, pain task force that really uh, was an unusual event that is intended with the report that came out to really help folks, no matter what part of the multi-stakeholder group you come from, to help address those items, those uh, challenges that are necessary for uh, great care that's effective to be done for patients. I'm also currently practicing as a, a pain physician at Stanford, and I've had really the honor to reintegrate over the last few months uh, after I returned back to civilian life and, and see patients again, and it's been just a huge joy. Next slide. And so in this time of COVID, I, it was very easy to get, uh, of course, involved in uh, one of the biggest public health crises, but this is not to forget certainly the current public health crisis of, of chronic pain in the United States. And it's still amazing to me when I look at these numbers that um, 50 million people are estimated to have chronic daily pain of which almost 20 million have high impact chronic pain that it affects their ability to function in their daily lives. It's always a humbling figure and one that we should remind ourselves in terms of the scope of work. And it's also uh, not quite the 100 million that one may have heard of, but the definitions vary. And the very important point is that a very uh, large portion of our society here in the United States uh, suffer from chronic pain. And people have asked, why is it that the US has more? We, we as a nation have historically identified, tried to diagnose and, and really understand the category of acute and chronic pain which now more than ever really needs to be and continue to be addressed, especially in the COVID-19 era where many of our patients have had greater challenges to all that they already uh, have and experience every day. Next slide.
So just as a reminder, the pain task force was overwhelmingly uh, passed. And, and the reason I bring this up is because it was a very unique uh, task force in that it was came from the CARA Act of 2016. So it's congressionally mandated. I say that because many of our efforts and papers or things that we know come from us, but this came from the US government. And it was unusual that it consisted of federal members from not only the Department of U, uh, HHS, but also the DOD and the VA. So the Defense Department and the VA, as well as people within HHS, CDC, NIH, FDA, and SAMHSA. Uh, and then non-federal organizations are professional uh, medical groups, organizations like the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, but also not necessarily uh, usual uh, stakeholders like the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons or Dental Surgeons, uh, veteran service organizations. We have the president of the Texas Medical Board and of course, patient advocacy groups who understand these issues in such a unique and more effective manner. And then specialty expertise that range from pain psychology to pharmacists uh, to uh, pain management experts, of course, but also included primary care doctors, substance use uh, doctors, ER clinicians, doctors, mental health experts, uh, surgeons, toxicologists, uh, all bringing to bear their experiences and different perspectives, which is very often unique. And we had great input from stakeholders in the payer world, as stakeholders from the private sector, companies that were trying to work on innovative solutions, and over 150 organizations, including the AMA and many others who supported this uh, with a real critical interest in what was being done. Next slide. And uh, just briefly, the comments, which were from the public, which many of those thousands were from patients, really looked at um, what treatment access problems they were having. That was one of their biggest concerns, uh, as well as decreased functionality that they were experiencing the effect in their normal life. The stigma uh, conflation with addiction, pain patients were being treated as though they are addicts and drug seekers. Of course, insurance issues and, and sadly enough, the rise in suicide related to chronic pain. Next slide. These comments were then used to develop an overview of the best practices for acute and chronic pain. That came down to five broad treatment categories, which we we're trying to be exclusive of all different types of treatment modalities. So medications, restorative therapies, which included PT or aqua therapy or other movement-based treatments, interventional procedures from very minor trigger points all the way to more uh, significant neuromodulation, behavioral therapies. This is so important, of course, in today's world. Complementary and integrative health, which includes included mindfulness, acupuncture, tai chi, yoga, spirituality, and then four cross-cutting policies that included risk assessment, stigma, access to care, and education. These four were really necessary and remain necessary even today to really address the whole multidisciplinary, individualized, patient-centered approach to pain. Next slide. By the way, these graphics were all developed by us. Um, this one I know Amy has shared that she really loves the individualized patient-centered approach. In this graphic, the purpose is really to exhibit, which we wrote in volumes, uh, how uh, patient A, B, C, and D may have their own unique uh, painful condition, comorbidities, cultural issues, social issues, economic considerations, how they go in to see their clinician and doctor, and then a therapeutic alliance is formed right in the middle of that box where considerations of all kinds of potential treatment modalities, depending on the diagnosis and, and uh, decision-making that is made by both the clinician as well as the patient, and then an integrative treatment plan is, is uh, discovered and more patient A, B, C, and D. These are randomly just put in order of how it can vary, even if people have the same diagnosis, um, how they can have a different plan. So patient A may have uh, ibuprofen yoga and nerve blocks. Patient B may have perhaps short-term um, opioids to get them through the flare while they're undergoing physical therapy to allow them to endure that and so on and so forth. Acupuncture, surgery, self-management, coping skills. There are so many different things that at least at the initial integrative treatment are considered. And then I would always say, and this is in my own practice, modify that treatment based on the patient's response, how they are doing there. You can't expect that people are gonna act 
and respond the same because we're certainly not robots. We have much in the way of individual variables. And so this is one of the major points of uh, the uh, entire report was that this variability is important. But once you appreciate that, you can rapidly get to the uh, goal of improved functionality and quality of life. Next slide, please. And uh, the approach to uh, pain management with a biopsychosocial model of pain management cannot be overstressed. There are the usual biological uh, factors that we all consider, but the psychological factors, mood, stress, all those are really vital to assess and to see what interventions, if any, are needed. Social factors that play such a large role, social support, patients are isolated. What is the kind of uh, life that they're leading at home? This is something that is very relevant right now with the shelter in across the nation and, and the adverse effect this has had on many, many patients, further exacerbating their already challenged uh, life. And, and we wanna really make sure that we're mindful of that. Next slide, please. Uh, so just briefly in those five uh, treatment categories as a review, medications, lots of different categories, over-the-counter, other types of medicines, it all depends on the patient. Why do each of these categories say anticonvulsants have different medicines? Because even if it's appropriate for a patient to get a nerve pain medicine, they may not respond to that. They may have side effects that someone else doesn't have. So you need a variety of different medicines. You need to go through that, explain it to the patient so they understand what the initial approach is really is to figure out what of the treatment modalities may work for them. Next slide, please. Interventional procedures vary by degree of complexity and invasiveness. There's so many different options. It all depends, of course, on what is the underlying condition, what is the patient experienced. Uh, are they in an acute flare situation where they have their usual pain, but it is flared up? And how do you define success? Sometimes success is just getting them out of the flare. Sometimes success is this is part of a long-term management plan. They get a procedure done once or twice a year in addition to say physical therapy or some medication, some degree of uh, multidisciplinary, multimodal approach that allows that patient to reach the goals that they have set with their clinician to achieve that quality of life. Next slide. And overcoming barriers to behavioral health approaches. I love that we're in an era where the first thing we're saying is what are the ba barriers is that often our patients are challenged with transportation issues or their distance from where the centers are that they're seeking treatment. Well, telehealth has really been expanded. I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, mobile health apps, public awareness campaigns, really taking away the stigma of what behavioral health is and knowing that it is a huge value in terms of how patients can develop very simple basic skills to having more intervention in, in the way of actual form of formal treatment for in fact a clinical disorders. So it could be just symptoms that are complicating their recovery uh, while they're in, in these chronic pain uh, treatment modalities, or it could be uh, much more serious issues. And there's a whole range of, of um, different uh, approaches and platforms. And telehealth has really expanded that. And of course, uh, CMS uh, with some of their actions of late in terms of reimbursement and equal parity for um, these types of telemedicine endeavors has definitely impacted behavioral health in a positive way. Next slide. Complementary and integrative health approaches, I do continue to see uh, improvement in terms of coverage. CMS did after uh, our pain task force uh, consulted with them as required by Congress, uh, approved acupuncture for low back pain. My guess is that uh, it's actually going to move in that direction depending on, of course, how some more uh, research is done and evidence uh, continues to showcase perhaps the subpopulation of folks who are beneficiaries uh, and other factors that play a role. Uh, but massage and manipulative therapies, acupuncture, spirituality was a huge one that a lot of folks felt that they uh, needed that as part of their uh, life to really uh, um, feel like there was uh, hope at the end and to be mindful of that yoga, Tai Chi, all really important parts of oftentimes what a patient may prefer in terms of a holistic, organic, more natural approach to chronic pain management. And it can complement, does not have to be exclusive of what we see as traditional Western medicine and then much more of an um, 
complementary integrative approach, these are not either ors. They are all intended to really uh, be uh, treatment options for patients so that they can uh, take what they believe in and still have all the um, uh, toolbox uh, items uh, available. Next slide. And then, of course, continued innovation. So again, telemedicine, this was all here before we had uh, the last two months uh, really expediting what probably was taking years and years, uh, would have been years to get us to the point we are, but that is really important. It does not replace uh, in-person um, uh, treatment, but it allows for folks who have challenges seeing their patients. It allows for clinicians, doctors. It certainly has been great for me to see patients and follow up with them and, and actually further fine tune and modify how the patients are doing after we start a treatment. Uh, it is uh, going to be here to stay. And uh, the hope is that we can continue to take advantage of this in really all realms, including physical therapy research, of course, uh, at further understanding of, of uh, mechanisms of pain. There's a lot going on in this realm. And then the special populations always keeping an eye out for that, which are groups that are more vulnerable, um, may have different risks. Those are children, pediatrics, women, elderly, the geriatric population, the challenges that are there due to the fact that they may have limited uh, ability to metabolize their liver or kidney functions, uh, also having more challenging chronic pain issues with arthritis, uh, but also non-age related problems that pop up with the geriatric elderly population, Native Americans and unique issues to them are active duty and veteran uh, population has had much in the way in terms of the challenges of disabilities or mental health issues uh, and uh, limited access often uh, in the transition to civilian life over the years. And then as an example, uh, chronic relapsing conditions like sickle cell that have limited options, uh, the acute porphyria community, I highlighted them a couple of weeks ago on my Twitter feed because it was Porphyria Awareness uh, Week and they had brave patients who wanted me to share their specific stories. And they have very limited options because they have a pharmacogenetic uh, disease. And so many uh, uh, really treatment options that we have for others are limited for them. And so highlighting these issues is really important. And people may think it's rare diseases, but you put a lot of rare diseases together. And what you find is there are a lot of folks out there who uh, are, are suffering. Next, next slide. A risk assessment is something I just wanted to take a minute to emphasize. We are all consciously or subconsciously doing a risk benefit analysis of what is good for the patients. I think emphasizing this again in, in terms of the conversations with the patient about what uh, treatments are there, taking the biopsychosocial approach and then reviewing what treatment modalities are there? What are the risks? And then stratifying the patient also into low, medium, and high risk in our minds with our patients to really continue to uh, approach that. Next slide. Some comments about barriers. This is something that I put in there so that the audience can see these later, but people are very significantly affected by stigma. This remains a big issue and uh, it's really sad. And I know that this is continue despite the efforts of folks to try to really uh, put in empathy and compassion, but I encourage you all to read these. These were just representative of hundreds and hundreds of comments. Next slide. Education, uh, national campaign awareness, patient education, uh, and legislative education as well as clinician education. The ECHO model is a great model that has continued to do this, uh, but we certainly need more national campaigns to help folks understand that pain is just a single term that does not describe the multitude of different complex or simple uh, pain conditions that people can get affected to and not to be judgmental of what the challenge that they have. Next slide. And I know I'm going to have to wrap up here. Access to care is another issue, again, uh, with acupuncture and telemedicine. We see progress in this area, but we certainly want to continue to ensure that we highlight uh, coverage that's often limited with physical therapy or having uh, enough time with the patient for complex pain management situations and addressing the shortage of pain specialists. Next slide. 
uh, and I've already mentioned telemedicine, it has moved at warp speed. Our hope is that this will continue as another option to continue to keep very close touch with patients who often need it. And uh, we will go to the next slide. I uh, also wanted to just mention the recommendations for a CDC update that there are patients who continue to remain uh, feeling abandoned, often treated as drug users, who are um, as, 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 in, enduring really significant challenges in this area when uh, we're at a time where we are looking at individualized patient-centered care to understand that there are patients who often have uh, followed the rules and have had significant improvement and can be documenting that and to be advocates for those patients uh, and, and not challenge them or be against them. This is really important. Next slide. And these are just FDA safety announcements uh, that were made. The CDC had also put a perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine about the continued concern about forced tapers and patient abandonment. You talk about people going out there feeling like no one is really there for them. And they may, of course, then look at more dangerous, desperate measures. And we have a duty really to ensure that that is not the case, that they're in a medically supervised arena. Next slide. Goal is to strike a balance between the current uh, substance use illicit drug crisis and treating chronic pain and to really often not confuse the two, but ensure that we are clear in those goals and who and how we're trying to affect folks. Next slide. Just want to briefly say that we have folks on the Hill and other places in leadership who remain uh, as steadfast partners. Senator Cassidy is a doctor and has really come out in support of some of the work that we are doing. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, I will conclude here because I promised Amy I will be on time and I may be even a minute off. I don't know. Yes, I'm three minutes probably late. So with that, I want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, and briefly just overall giving an overall summary of some of the real advancements. I know people will go over all these things, but thank you and thank you on behalf of the patients. Thanks, Dr. Singh. This is uh, fantastic. It's, it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce Ben Kliegler. He's the uh, Acting Executive Director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation at the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, he was formerly co-director of Beth Israel Fellowship Program in Integrative Medicine, uh, former chair of the Consortium for Academic Health Centers for Integrative Medicine. Ben is, is just such an outstanding leader, uh, author, researcher, educator, and most importantly, I, I think a mentor. I think he steps into progressively bigger and bigger shoes uh, throughout his career. Uh, never is taking easy missions. Certainly the one he's in now is, is challenging. And he's going to share with us uh, some insight on the, the VA's whole health initiative. So Ben, I'll turn it over to you and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, thank you, Kevin. Just want to confirm that you guys hear me. Yes, you got it. Great. And thank you, Kevin. My shoes are feeling... Yes, it's hard to walk, but uh, I'm still plugging away. So uh, thank you for having me, and it's great to follow Dr. Singh, and I just want to say I hope everyone knows how fortunate we are to have had her in particular in the role on the HHS Tax Force. That that work is going to really uh, propel us forward in, in a great way. Um, and you'll notice when I talk about what we're doing in the VA, a really a lot of echoes in what the task force um, stressed, as in individualizing care, uh, focusing care around the goals of the patient being the most important, uh, not getting hung up on that we are treating the same disease in the same way all the time, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of echoes there, and I, I think we'll find that really helpful going forward. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk to you about what we in the VA call whole health, and specifically about some outcomes in a very large scale um, sort of demonstration project that's ongoing in the VA. Um, whole health, this is our definition, an approach to healthcare that empowers and equips people to take charge of their health and well being and live their life to the fullest. Whole health is a term that was more or less VA specific and now recently seems to be catching on um, as a term on the outside as well. Uh, it has an overlap with integrative health, integrative medicine, uh, but in some ways it's a little more all encompassing in that it it includes integrative health and integrative medicine in what we really uh, imagine as a cultural transformation, a, a, a change in how we look at the patient and at the role of the healthcare system. Next slide. 
So the way we're delivering whole health in the VA is something called the whole health system. I'm going to talk about this for a minute so that the results I'm sharing have some context for you. There are three components to the whole health system. The top, what you see there is called the pathway. This is a non-clinical experience that veterans can go through where they talk with a fellow veteran peer, uh, perhaps a health coach. Uh, it could be in an individual setting. It could be in a group setting. And they really start the conversation about what's important to them in their life. What do they feel is giving their life meaning? What is their life purpose? And what is it they need to do or how do they want to move forward towards that purpose in their life? And this is kind of really the foundation of the whole health system is the idea of having that conversation, starting that conversation, and then having that conversation carry through the rest of your interaction with the healthcare system. So the second component you can see there bottom left is the well-being programs. This is where veterans can access some of the complementary integrative therapies like acupuncture and massage, but also where yoga, tai chi, meditation, a lot of the self-management oriented complementary therapy approaches will happen here as well as health coaching, health education, really all the stuff that provides the tools to equip people to move to where they wanna be. And then the third circle down on the lower right is what we call whole health clinical care. Obviously to install these two new ideas of the well-being programs and the pathway without making sure that the clinicians, the primary care docs, the mental health clinicians, surgeons, nurses, everybody is oriented around the importance of recognizing what's most important to the veteran, um, we wouldn't get that far. So that circle involves a lot of training and professional development and conversation with uh, clinical folks around the VA about what does this really mean to bring it into care. And then we use something called the personal health plan to kind of tie all this together, which is more or less a living document that's owned by the veteran that moves through their interactions with the healthcare system so that what's important to them stays front and center. Next slide. Uh, a lot of amazing traction for this in the VA uh, as a system. People that don't know about the VA, it's the largest uh, integrated federal health system in the country. There are um, something like 160 plus medical centers. Uh, there are a total of 9 million patients enrolled in VA. Uh, pretty big health system, really. Um, this is a strategic plan for all of VA, 18 to 24, and you can see right there, we are right there in the strategic plan. VA will improve veteran health outcomes by shifting from a system primarily focused on disease management to one that's based on partnering with the veterans and focused on whole health. And this is what I meant in referring to uh, the HHS plan, where we really are, are I think, in, in strong step with that plan and with a lot of where healthcare is going. So we're in the strategic plan. Next slide. We uh, have a lot of support in Congress, in particular, the CARA legislation in 2016, which is the main thing I'm going to talk to you about, uh, mandated lots of things around pain management and addiction care, but also specifically mandated increased access to complementary integrative health and well-being services across the VA. And I'm going to share with you some of the results, uh, which are actually in a report that went up to Congress in, in April. Uh, continue to have a lot of strong support from the House Veteran Affairs Committee, the Senate, uh, the Milk Count Appropriations Committee. It's really wonderful how strongly a lot of the folks in Congress feel about this. Next slide. Just a quick diagram to show you. These are uh, sites across the VA that have engaged with whole health in one form or another, some of them much more than others, uh, but just to give you a sense of kind of the geographic scope and uh, really happening all over the place. Next slide. So what I wanna share now in the rest of my time is the evaluation of uh, a program we call the Whole Health Flagship Program. Uh, one of the provisions in the CARA legislation mandated that the VA set up a minimum of 15 demonstration sites around the country to look at what happens when complementary integrative health and well-being services are provided uh, in a more robust way to veterans with pain. And so the VA identified 18 sites, 18 because there are 18 uh, regional networks in the VA, which we call VISMs, and starting now two and a half years ago, uh, stood up. 18 three-year demonstration projects uh, across the country. And part of that was a robust evaluation process and outcome evaluation, which has been led by 
our wonderful partners from VA Health Systems Research and Development. And their names are listed here. I won't use the time to read off their names, but a wonderful group. And this report that I'm going to be talking to you about is uh, available as a white paper. It's on our website. And I think at some point somebody will put the link <laughs> in chat box to where you can download this whole report if you're interested. Next slide. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of what services we're talking about when we talk about the evaluation of the impact of whole health, which is what I'm going to share now. Uh, VA covers eight evidence-based complementary integrative health approaches as part of standard benefits, and that does not include chiropractic care, which has been included in VA care as really a part of mainstream care through rehab uh, since 2005 but we coordinate obviously closely with chiropractic. And you can see there the eight evidence-based program, evidence-based approaches that are part of standard VA medical benefits now. Um, we think that this is a pretty big deal because as far as we know, VA has stepped way out front of other large health systems in terms of comprehensively including uh, the evidence-based integrative health uh, modalities in medical benefits. Equally important is what we labeled here, the core whole health services. So it's not just about replacing an opioid prescription with an acupuncture treatment. It's about helping empower people and transform the way they look at their pain. And the core services that are important here are personal health planning, whole health coaching, the facilitated groups that I talked about where veterans get to explore their meaning and purpose and how they can strengthen their own skills to move towards that. So this is the package of services that when we talk about the 18 flagships and the outcomes I'm going to share with you, this is what we're talking about. Next slide. Oop. There we go. So at the 18 flagships around the country, and some of these are geographically all around the country, some of them are very large facilities, Boston, VA, Atlanta, VA. Some of them are quite small, Saginaw, Erie, not very large. Uh, Toma, Wisconsin. So really a wide spectrum geographically in terms of who gets served and the size of the facility. So across those 18 facilities, as of third quarter in FY19, 31% of veterans with chronic pain had engaged in some kind of whole health services. And that's defined as two or more visits in any of the categories that I showed you on the previous slide. So we were very happy with this level of reach. And I think what it suggests is that the demand from veterans is huge that the openness from clinical staff is really in some ways bigger than we thought it was um, because of the pace at which this utilization has, has caught on. Uh, COVID has obviously thrown us a curveball. Uh, a lot of face-to-face -face services are currently curtailed, but we're doing a lot via telehealth. And um, at least prior to COVID, we were anticipating that 44% of veterans with chronic pain at these 18 sites would have been engaged in whole health uh, by the end of this fiscal year. So hope, looking forward to getting back to that. Uh, next slide. So what do we see in terms of impacts in veterans who are engaged? This slide kind of gives you an overall summary, which maybe you want to refer back to. Um, I think I'm going to jump past this to the next one because I'm going to talk about each of these things in turn. Next slide. So I think one of the most important things we've seen uh, is that users of whole health uh, have a more rapid decline in average milliequivalent opioid dose than non-users of whole health. So what do I mean? Uh, opioid utilization is decreasing across the VA, as we would expect. VA has been way up front with that. So that's the black column on the left. These are veterans who did not use any whole health. Then the next column is people who only used one service, then two or more. And then the two right-hand columns, I'm not going to go too far into the definitions of these, but these are people who had eight or more visits uh, to whole health services. And what you see here is that uh, Veterans who had no visits to whole health reduced their opioid average dose by 11% over the course of this study year. Veterans who had eight or more whole health visits uh, reduced their opioid utilization by 38%. So we're looking at a three and a half times faster reduction. Now, granted, this is not a randomized study. This is an observational study. Uh, so it's clear that some of this data could be correlation and not causation. Uh, but nevertheless, definitely correlation in the right direction. And even you could say a dose effect uh, sort of, a, you know, a image here where more whole health services, more rapid decline in opioid use. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. So this is a little harder to see, but I think a couple of really important things on this slide in particular, 
over on the right hand surface, uh, right hand section of the slide, there's a validated instrument called the Life, Meaning, and Purpose Scale. Oh, I should add that where this data is coming from is a very large uh, male survey to veterans, patient reported outcome survey, randomly selected veterans with chronic pain diagnosis at the 18 flagship sites. This data is from the first wave analysis, which we did to uh, produce the congressional report that went up in April. So this data is based on 3,266 veterans with chronic pain at the flagships who uh, returned both a baseline and a six month survey. The survey was comprised of a number of validated instruments that we put together into one. You'll see some of them in the next couple of slides. That's where this data comes from. This data set is still growing. We're hoping that by the time we're done, we'll be around seven or 8,000 veterans and we'll be able to take the outcomes out to a year. But I'm um, talking faster now because time is getting short. Uh, the meaning and purpose, you can see that users of eight or more whole health visits, again, which is that bar on the right, uh, had a substantial increase, and this is effect sizes as opposed to um, uh, p-values just because it's a, it's a work in progress basically, but really decent sized improvement in a sense of meaning and purpose. Why is this important? Obviously, uh, preventing suicide is a huge VA priority and a national priority. Uh, the idea that for many people, loss of purpose in life correlates with suicide risk is pretty well established. And so we think this is very significant, that it's not just about treating the pain with a modality, but working towards establishing what's important to you in your life is really going to help potentially mitigate suicide risk. Next slide. Uh, similarly important, I think, if you want to look on the right hand, which is the PEG, which is a, th a three-item pain scale that VA uses. We all use several other pain measures on this um, outcome study, including the uh, veterans, uh, defense of veterans pain uh, scale, which is also very useful. Um, bottom line here, you see that there is some improvement in pain, not a huge improvement in pain, uh, but some in the right direction uh, in veterans who are using eight or more services. And importantly, that's while opioid usage was declining at a very rapid rate. So we look at maintaining or even slight improvement in pain, reported pain as a, as a plus. And then second from the right hand, you'll see that's the perceived stress scale, a four item validated scale, looking at how, how stressed did you feel over the course of the last, the, the most immediate period of time. And that really is about how much in control of your life do you feel? If you look at the questions on that, that's really what's being asked. So good improvement in stress, which we correlate with overall well-being. And then more on that slide, but I won't go into all the details. Next slide. Um, important also, I think probably a lot of people on this call are healthcare providers. Uh, we also looked at the impact on employees of working in a hospital with greater engagement in, um, uh-oh, okay, super fast. Uh, working in a hospital with greater engagement with whole health, uh, people were more likely to feel it was the best place to work, less likely to intend to quit, lower burnout, et cetera. Next slide. So we think not only is this good for veterans, but this is good for staff. And obviously a facility where staff is happy is a facility that's gonna provide better care. So just some quotes from veterans to make it real. I think the bottom one, which is from a veteran from uh, St. Louis VA, I used to drive over the Mississippi River Bridge to Jefferson Barracks VA and think about jumping every time. The whole health system has helped me explore my purpose, find ways to use nutrition, reduce my pain, and use eye rest and Tai Chi to get moving again. Now I drive over that bridge and think about tomorrow and I have hope. So I think that's all I have and um, really appreciate the opportunity to present and I hope I've piqued your interest and you'll go take a look at um, some of the details in the report, which you can download and, and take a look at. I'll stop there. And I think I am supposed to introduce Cindy and I won't take much of your time, Cindy, for the introduction. Uh, Cindy is National Policy and Advocacy Director of the US Pain Foundation, Policy Council Chair at Massachusetts Pain Initiative and has been, I think, very instrumental in some of the really uh, impressive progress they've made in Massachusetts in terms of moving toward more integrative approach to pain care. and. I think if it's okay, Cindy, I'll stop there and just hand it over to you so you can use all your time. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben, really appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yep, great. Okay, next slide. So we have heard from Dr. Siegler and Dr. Singh about the ideal uh, pain 
treatment that can happen with, a, with an integrative care program. But let's talk about what people really face uh, and what's real. Next slide. So, you know, for most people um, who are searching for pain care, it's a real struggle to find care, especially in the last few years. Pain sufferers typically see four or five practitioners before they find help. Sometimes it could take years. Um, most treatments are often ineffective or inadequate, and we hear a lot that people aren't believed, um, that practitioners unfortunately lack empathy, um, and people are stigmatized. You know, they're called doctor shoppers or drug seekers and often treated in a dismissive manner. Next slide. And we've heard also how fragmented care can be, how it lacks coordination, how often individuals are left to piece it together on their own. Um, it's a real struggle. Most practitioners and patients really still lack an understanding that chronic pain really is a disease itself uh, with no cure. And it takes years sometimes to learn that managing it really requires combining therapies that are specific to every individual. Patients constantly confront barriers, cost, uh, lack of reimbursement, doctors' fears still about prescribing and other things, long wait for pain specialists. Sometimes people have to wait a year to get an appointment with a pain specialist. And for those specialty clinics, referrals are often required. Next slide. Meanwhile, chronic pain is devastating people's lives. You feel like you're trapped in your own body. I often talk about that. Um, and it's even worse than that because oftentimes people suffer, they feel like they're being tortured with no means of escape. Um, pain affects our ability to work, to socialize. Oftentimes people lose relationships, they can't sleep, um, often can't engage in things that bring you joy and make life meaningful. Um, people um, lose their self-esteem when they can't work and they can't contribute, they can't be productive, often their friendships and become very isolated. Next slide. I often call it uh, the search for help, the roller coaster of chronic pain treatment, where you know, you're searching for something, you try a new treatment, you get your hopes up, this is gonna be it, it's really gonna help me. You try it for a week or two weeks, even a month, um, you invest money and energy and time, and then your hopes are dashed when it doesn't help. Um, and people try treatments over and over again, trying to stay, stay hopeful, but oftentimes you're, you're on this roller coaster. Next, next slide, please. And I <laughs> also say that the state of the art of pain treatment, um, then meaning 20 years ago when I myself was seriously injured and I was searching for help, and even now, I just led a support group the other day where a 24 year old woman came in and said, um, you know, she feels like they're just guessing at what to do and oftentimes don't believe her. Um, I would envision that doctors are blindfolded, just trying different things. Um, and sometimes something actually hits the target and really helps you, but many times it doesn't. Next slide. So what is you know, really trying to um, make this come about mean? It really means confronting all kinds of barriers, um, but um, you know, you're pushing against a system um, that's entrenched and um, you know, it takes a lot of pain, uh, a lot of persistence, I mean, to really get um, to change the system. You know, barriers are sometimes physicians' lack of understanding that really an integrative model is the best we have right now. Um, and that, uh, physicians lack time that it takes to really have people try these different things and come back and report whether or not that helped. Um, insurers often don't cover complementary therapies and we face uh, pharmacy benefit management practices like prior authorization and step therapy and non-medical switching that delay getting you other kinds of treatments that might help you. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of uh, what we're doing in Massachusetts. This one place I've worked as well as the federal level 
Um, and it requires persistence and patience to push against this system um, when you don't have something like the VA where you can make whole health really happen. Um, so in Massachusetts over the past couple of years, like in most states, from about 2013 to 2016, you know, lawmakers were writing bills and the main effort was to severely limit or ban opioid prescribing. And I felt like working in the legislative space that we were constantly on the defensive, um, you know, trying to make sure things didn't come out too badly for people with pain until about 2017 when uh, we decided to really switch to the offense and say, look, you know, you are making it much harder for people with pain to access opioids. We have to give people other options. Um, we met with some insurers and they were often unwilling to pay for things. They said, show us the evidence. Uh, and so I work with lawmakers to draft a bill to really require insurers, both public and private in Massachusetts to cover a range of pain management services. Next slide, please. So what did that bill include? So as I mentioned, it pertained to all public and private carriers in the Commonwealth. Carriers, uh, our language was, had to provide adequate coverage and access to a broad spectrum of pain management services. And the pain management plan we, we wrote needs to be a component of carrier accreditation subject to approval. Uh, otherwise, we, don't, we were afraid carriers wouldn't voluntarily do this. Um, we decided to um, actually have carriers distribute educational materials to providers about what their pain management plan had and have them required to post information on all of their websites about their pain management plan. And then the D Division of Insurance would really carry forward and write the guidelines and standards for what these pain management services were going to be, and also assess network adequacy of carriers' plans. Next slide, please. So we worked hard to get this language of this bill into a larger opioid package that was moving in Massachusetts. And ultimately, this was enacted as part of the CARE Act, which was signed by Governor Baker in August of 2018. It included a number of pain management provisions, which we were proud to have gotten in this bill. It was a very balanced bill. Um, and then subsequent to that, in December of 2018, the Division of Insurance drafted guidance um, to carry out what we meant by this broad spectrum of services for pain management. Unfortunately, the first guidance fell far short of what I felt was legislative intent. It required one alternate medication and one alternate non-medication treatment to be covered. And you know, we stayed on that and uh, wrote comments to the guidance, had a number of calls with the insurance commissioners and deputy insurance commissioner, um, till finally they issued a new guidance in August of 2019, which was progress. They were gonna require two alternate medications and three non-medication treatment modalities. So I said, progress is slow, but it happens. And you know, step one was to get the legislative language, but you're not done there. You really have to stay, pay attention to it because you have to see what the regulatory language looks like. Next slide, please. So the pain management plans were due to the Division of Insurance in October of 2019. So just this past October, and the plans were to take, take effect in January, just this past January of 2020. Uh, on October the 3rd, I happened to be listening to NPR, and I heard an announcement that Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Massachusetts was gonna cover acupuncture for pain up to 12 visits with no prior authorization starting January the 1st. And I, I really had a smile because the announcement didn't mention that that was a requirement of this law, um, but that was just fine. Uh, we, we knew that, um, that it was, and we were glad to have made that happen. Um, I have now requested copies of all the pain management plans and we'll be following up on them to see um, what these pain management plans look like because we can still uh, put some pressure on to continue to have those carriers carry out the legislative language. Um, progress was slow and enacting the law, as I said, was just step one. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, progress toward our goal of multi multidisciplinary and integrative pain management is starting to happen. 
Um, and uh, we're pleased about that, but a long way to go. Thank you. That's it. So I guess we have a break now and we'll see everybody back at 320. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Cindy, we, Kevin is, oh, Kevin, you're on mute. I'm off. Thank yeah, you're good. good. Thank so you. So we weren't okay. gonna do uh, questions uh, during this presentation. Uh, Amy, we're still gonna stick with that plan, correct? We have three minutes if we wanna do a question. Well, I don't know if, if you've tracked any, and thank you everybody for uh, submitting questions and, and putting some chats in. I think it's been very, although we're not able to respond uh, with the, the volume of feedback that's coming in right now, uh, we are, like Amy said, taking all these in and we'll try to follow up uh, afterwards with everybody to, to answer so, the question. So, so Kevin? Uh, I don't know if anything's come to the top of the... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Kevin? Yeah. Um, so on that note, I see, and my apologies if we are doing this in an order that is frustrating to anyone on the call. We appreciate all of you on this and we're, um, but I know there was a question to Ben Kligler, was San Francisco VA one of the demo sites for the study? And they uh, added very positive study results. Kudos to the team. <laughs> <laughs> um, San Francisco was not one of the flagship sites, as we call them. San Francisco has been uh, doing a lot with complementary integrative health and whole health, though, for a number of years, and they continue to be uh, doing some really important work there, so. Wonderful. <clears throat> um, also, just trying to get a few questions in rather quickly. Um, uh, Stephen Grinstead asked why, um, asked if spiritual component was included uh, to uh, Dr. Singh. Yeah, absolutely. So that, in fact, was included. And thank you for asking it and bringing it up. It was included as a part of the complementary and integrative health. Uh, the five broad treatment uh, categories, that was definitely a part of the complementary integrative health. It's a great section on spirituality. And it was something that was really driven by many patients in their comments and in the testimonials. So we appreciate that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And um, and there's a question for Cindy. Um, why is, the, oh, this is from Malcolm Herman. Why is there such a gap between the VA model and the outcomes on the ground for non-VA patients? Good question. You know, the VA model is a, is a closed system and there's a lot of control over what can happen. Uh, integrative care, I think, is a lot easier to manage when you're not in a fragmented system like us with everybody having different insurers and different insurers having different things that they're going to reimburse for and networks, which are could be, you know, anywhere. Some people are going in network, out of network. So it, it's a really, you know, we're, we're facing a tough battle in uh, the non-VA world to really make this happen. Uh, there are pain centers that do have some of these integrated um, you know, care models and have the services within them, but they're not many anymore. They used to be years ago, but we hope to bring those back. Thanks and, for the question. Uh, yeah, I would just add a tiny bit to that, which is I think it's an opportunity for payers and insurers uh, to, to think about what's possible if you do um, sort of take the leap and, and this whole concept of being able to move more quickly towards value-based care for pain management if you are willing to take the leap and start to cover more of the uh, whole person kind of services. I think that's part of our goal is to show that it's possible. I totally agree we have an easier sell since we are the health system and the payer. Uh, that definitely makes it easier to, to, to get stuff off the ground. But I think there's a hopefully a lot of interest. I know we've presented to through the a, a, a sip them to a number of uh, of large payers, and there is definitely a lot of interest in in moving that dial. So, mm -hmm. if Good. I can just add on to, I think it's just about showing that they have an incentive too, even in the private payer models. That is sometimes it's the short term that looks like deny a, a service, or uh, but actually it makes so much sense if if they see their long term 
financial costs even uh, when a large uh, value-based approach is, is given, then I think even they in their model, business model, would find that there's value for it without a doubt. Certainly what is person-centered, uh, I think ultimately is also serving the business model for the private payers as well. So hopefully we can show, showcase that through such uh, you know, discussions. And just to add on to that, I guess I would, to make it convincing, you know, if you think about all of the wasted visits that people make looking for care, and they go from doctor to doctor to doctor with pain, and you captured those costs, I think you would see that an integrated model right from the start would be more cost effective than what people confront now. It could take years for people to find treatment now and, you know, 20 visits uh, that didn't work out. So I think it's in the long run, it, it will be cost effective. Thank, thank you. And Kevin, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just realizing looking at our time too that we, we don't have time for more questions to allow for the, for the break. Do you want me to kick it back to you, Kevin, to close this and get us, get us on track? Yeah, and I, I, I think the, the first couple panels and the fact is we're on track. We're not running late. We've had <laughs> major technical snafus and we're all sort of learning how to do this uh like everybody <laughs> it's been so, great. <laughs> uh thanks to everybody we're gonna pause for a minute get everybody to get up and stretch their legs we're going into the early evening uh so we're gonna start at 3 20 with our next panel and we'll be back refreshed and ready to go and i, I know this next panel is going to be very exciting as as was the last two so thank you all we'll see you at 3.20 to start. So that's just a few minutes away, everyone. Don't go too far. And last reminder, your slides for all the presenters are available on our website. And the, and the questions that you have asked that haven't yet been answered, our presenters will um, have kindly agreed to answer them. And that will be shared again. So we just want you to know that. Thank you. <laughs>